And uh, welcome to our second installment of our discussion on the Hasidic approach to joy. Our discussion is reviewing the book, The Hasidic Approach to Joy by, joy by uh, Rabbi Shlom, uh, Shlomo Majeski. Uh, the book is available, uh, a digital copy is available uh, at Chabad.org. Uh, you can also order on Amazon.com. Active duty members and veterans can request a free copy of the book through Aleph Institute or reach out to me directly to connect you with one of the chaplains there. In the first section, we talked about um, in the Hasidic approach to door is that everything that happens comes from God and that everything that comes from God is good by definition. Um, we talked about the examples of Rabbi Akibi and Rabbi, Rabbi Nachum Ishgamazu, who had an attitude, a positive attitude at all times of everything is good. And we looked at the distinction between those two, everything will be good, it'll turn out to be good, or everything is good, you know, that this too itself is good, and, and how those sometimes could manifest themselves uh, that way as well. But we want to talk today <coughs> about sometimes it's hard to see that. It's hard to see the good, and especially when, um, when challenging things come up. And so we want to remember that everything is, is um, that God does is, is purpose oriented and if, that God is the epitome of goodness. So everything has to have a positive purpose for it. Um, it's just that sometimes we don't, we don't get to see that part of it. Sometimes we don't see it because our, our vision is too short. Uh, sometimes we don't merit to see the good part of it. But the more we understand how God controls every event that occurs, the more we can understand how that ultimately it is good. So some of the challenges we, we, we don't see are when things appear, at least in our vision, to be not good, the opposite of, of good things. So we're going to start off again with a story, because that seems to be the biblical way of doing things is learn by stories, right? And we're going to talk about a story that's described in the Talmud, and this is uh, in, the, in Medrash, it's described in the Medrash. One of our sages, Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi, had a number of, uh, of sessions with Eliyahu Hanavi. The prophet Eliyahu would periodically show himself to Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi, and they would have conversations. And at one point, Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi requested that he be able to, uh, to accompany uh, to accompany um, Eliyahu and Navi on his journeys and to learn from him. And, Rabbi, and uh, Eliyahu and Navi said, absolutely not. There's just no way you would comprehend what's going on. It will be over your head and you would be, uh, it would be very confusing. And, he, and so, of course, he pushed, he pushed, and he pushed. And Rabbi El, uh, Eliyahu and Navi finally said that he would acquiesce, but on one condition. And the condition is that as soon as he starts asking questions, deals off, we go our own separate ways. So Rabbi Yeshua agreed to that idea, and off they set, and they set off on their journey. Uh, towards the evening, they arrived at a shaky old hut. There was an elderly couple was sitting outside there, and whilst the, the features was, uh, you know, dimensions of dignity, they were obviously very poor, uh, very, very poor. And yet their, their poverty did not hamper their openness and warmth. And so they reached out to the guests and then welcomed them in. And they shared whatever, whatever meager things they had, they shared with them with, with joy and, and, and happiness. And although the, you know, the meal was a bit lacking and the accommodations were a bit lacking, what was made up for uh, quite absolutely in, in, the, in the joy of the mitzvah of Hachnas of having guests. The couple was absolutely thrilled to have the guests there. When the morning came, the two travelers bid farewell and they set off on their journey again. And as they were leaving, Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi noticed that Eliyahu and Navi started to daven, to pray. So he leaned closer to try and listen and see what the prayer was. And he heard Eliyahu and Navi praying that the host that they had just had, that their cow should die. Uh, Rabbi Yeshua was kind of taken aback. They had been so kind and so pleasant. And, and that cow is like their, 
primary source of income. It was the milk from that cow that provided their, their meager substance. And so like, and you're asking for that to, to die. But he made a commitment and he, so he can't ask a question. So, so he doesn't ask, but he's definitely confused. They continue on their journey. He thought that Eliyahu Novi would talk about what happened and he didn't offer any explanations or anything. Uh, they continued other conversations of Torah. And uh, towards evening, they came to a new place. This place was a beautiful mansion, a beautiful mansion with lots of exquisite uh, decor. And although many members of the household staff and everything had, had seen them, no one offered any hospitality. So they went up to the house, knocked on the door, and they asked for permission to stay in the home for the night. So the man reluctantly agreed, and he was very cold, offered them a place to stay, but did not offer any food or anything else, and left them to their own devices. They spent the night there. In the morning, they left without any fanfare or any greetings or anything else. Uh, they just, they, they left. And as they left, again, Abi Yeshua heard Eliyahu and Navi with his prayers and he heard that uh, one of the walls in the wealthy man's house was cracked and was weak. And Eliel had prayed that this wall should be restored and strengthened and remain strong and solid. And Rabbi Yeshua was like, the guy did nothing for us. Why are you praying that his, he shouldn't have any damage to his house? There shouldn't be any, you know, it, it didn't, again, it didn't make sense, but there was no explanation coming. So he continued on the journey. The next day, uh, they're, they're traveling in. <coughs> they come to a beautiful city. Everything about the city uh, reflected prosperity and opulence. They made their way to the show. What a magnificent structure. The, you know, elegance and style and design, even the, the benches were, were beautiful. And so they went there for evening prayers. The custom in old towns were that if you, you came to evening prayers, if you're a stranger in town, you came for evening services. And after evening services, someone would inevitably invite you home for a meal, place to stay. They would, you know, see who the guests are and, and, and take care of them. So they went to the synagogue and they there for the prayers and, um, and no one invited them. No one said hello. No one asked them how they're doing. No one asked them if they'd eaten, if they had a place to stay. Very cold. And um, so they ended up spending the night sleeping on the benches in the synagogue and, uh, and, and eating whatever they had brought with them. <coughs> in the morning, as they departed, again, Eliyahu spent some time in prayer and Yeshua ben Levi listened for, forward to find what, would be, what the prayer was this time. And he saw that Rabbi, Huda, that Rabbi Eliyahu ben Eliyahu and Novi was praying that this town, that in this town, everyone should become a leader. Everyone should become a leader. And again, he thought that was interesting because this, the whole town had not been pleasant. Not, not one person had invited them in. It was kind of strange. But he, he couldn't ask questions because that would be the end of the ride. So he didn't say anything. At, um, he goes to the next city. <coughs> this time, it's a, it's a nice city. Uh, nothing spectacular, nothing as particularly beautiful, but it was a nice and warm community. They went to the synagogue, and uh, and of course they did the evening services there. And um, and people asked them, you know, everyone in the community started to ask them about, do you have a place to stay, and can we have you for a meal, and would you like to have come to our house? And and they were blessed with nice accommodations for the evening, and again in the morning. When it was time to leave, Eliyahu Navi was praying, and the prayer this time was that in, in this city, only one, only one person should be blessed to become a leader. And at this point, Rabbi Yeshua Levi, he couldn't, he couldn't take it anymore. He couldn't, it was too much. And he said, I know, I'm going to ask the question, it's going to end the journey, but I, I, I got to know, I got to know what is going on with these four last evenings and your prayers. I, I, it, doesn't, it doesn't make sense. 
And so the Alba began and he explained. The elderly couple whom we first met, they were wonderful people performing acts of goodness and kindness, and I certainly wanted to give them a blessing. It was destined before we came that that woman was going to pass away that very evening. That was her last day of life. The fact that they had opened their home to Achnosus Orchim, to, to uh, having guests, even though they didn't have much of their own self, that midst in and of itself was enough to, to save her life, but it didn't, it didn't completely, the, uh, the, the decree itself was not completely lifted. And so I had prayed that their cow, their cow would die and they take the decree off of her and that she would live on for many good and healthy years. And, and, that, and that prayer, that was the prayer that I offered. And the cow's death would actually be, therefore, really a blessing for them um, because of the, it, would, it would be better for both of them to stay together. Regarding the old miser's house, the wall that had a crack, there was a treasure buried within the wall. He didn't use his wealth wisely to begin with. He shouldn't have any more. And I prayed that that wall should stay strong and firm and he should not have access to additional funds because he wasn't already using his funds wisely. As far as the first the, the third and fourth communities, my prayer that they should all become leaders in that first city, that's not a blessing. If anything, it's the opposite of a blessing. <laughs> Too many chiefs, not enough Indians. It's a mess, right? And, and in the city that I did bless that should have only one leader, that's a real blessing. A real blessing was, is one leader who can, whom everyone can get behind. That's, that's a true blessing. So this is the story that the Medrash shares about uh, travel, you know, Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi traveling with uh, Eliav and Navi and kind of explains the, the pieces to it. And it's like, <coughs> life is like a puzzle. If you've got a 5,000 piece puzzle, but you're only holding three or four pieces, they don't make any sense. Until you get all of the pieces, it doesn't make any sense. Our life, the way we live our life, we, we don't have all the pieces to the puzzle. We don't know all the details of our own life, let alone, let alone the lives of the people around us. We don't have all the pieces. And so it's no wonder that we don't understand you know, the, the bigger picture of what's going on and therefore it, it comes to a matter of, of faith and trust that, that there's a God and he knows what's going on. And, and he has the big picture. He has the big picture. Excuse me, just a moment. So it's, it's expanding, expanding our horizons <laughs> to be able to know that there's a bigger picture and the, the picture that we see has its limitations. And if we would know that there, you know, that there's a God and he has a big picture, then we can also know that in the big picture, the things that we don't understand, he does understand. And they really are all, all for the good. <coughs> there's, this idea is, is good, but there are some times where Things are obviously not good and downright painful. People are, have accidents. People die. Uh, people die in unpleasant situations. How is that good? And so, again, we have to see that there's a much bigger picture. We, there's a story of, um, of the Fidik Rebbe, the previous Lubavitcher Rebbe, who was imprisoned for by the Soviet uh, regime. And it was because of his efforts towards continuing keeping Judaism alive in, in Soviet Russia. And at some point under interrogation, someone had taken a pistol uh, and, and threatened him with a pistol and said, this, this has made many a man talk. And the, the Fidi Kadeba's response was, that toy can be scary for someone who has many gods in one world. But for someone who has one God and many worlds, that's not frightening. For those who understand that, that there's a much bigger picture here, and life doesn't end 
in this world, just in this physical world. We have Olam Haba, the world to come, and that the world to come, the soul may leave this body, but it ascends to a spiritual world, and it, that's not the end of the journey. You know, our, uh, our principles of faith, Maimonides talks about the principles of faith, and one of those 13 principles is that there is an afterlife, there is a soul that goes on into the afterlife beyond our material world, and that there is a techeus amazing, there's a resurrection of the dead, so that the end of this world, there's an, another world, which is then the, the, a world of resurrection, where again, that neshama will be back. And so this is only the antechamber. This is just a, a small part of a much, much bigger piece of the world. And so knowing this, we can see that there's a, that there's a you know, much bigger picture, not just a, 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 a puzzle in our physical world, but that extends past, uh, past that as well. And Perfect. that- uh, I'm just wondering, is, is that how you explain the death of, uh, infants and young children that that they're just missing the first part of the journey or so there's an interesting story there <laughs> that's going to come up later okay that it particularly addresses um some of those challenges and the emotions associated with it but we'll definitely come to that one uh, but not okay. every every time in other words every single journey is unique and so there may be sometimes an explanation for this one or that one, but they don't always apply to the, the same stories. So not all child mortality will be the same. Um, but, but there are some examples that we have to reflect on that give us some sense of, of, of comfort. Dave? I was going to ask, is that story about the, the Friedrich Rabbi, Rabbi uh, not willing to tell, not willing to give a blessing? to uh, the parents right. they have. A we'll come up to that one, that, the Bell Shem story, yeah. Yeah, that's it, okay. Yeah, we'll come to that one. So it's true that in this life, a person may suffer, but in Olam Haba, in the world of souls, he will reap the reward and the good that comes from the suffering. So that what we talk about is physical suffering in this this world has, uh, has its counterpart. So we look at, for example, the, the book of Yov, jo, uh, book of Job, uh, Eov in Hebrew, book of Eov, which states that even if a person uh, were to suffer a, a life of, of 70 years like Eov, um, that it still would be insignificant compared to the world to come. So we, we look at, if we look at uh, a shadow on the, uh, on the physical world, a shadow um, moves here, but, but the sun, the traveling across space is huge. And so like, if this is a small spot, you know, it may be traveling just a little bit here, but a longer distance there. It's the same way, the suffering that we, that we have in this world is disproportionate in, in, this, in the spiritual world. So, so therefore we can accomplish so much more in the physical world. Our suffering here counts for so much more. So, I don't mean to be argumentative, but these are questions that I ask myself all the time. Why would God want anybody to suffer in this world? Okay, good. Good question. The goal of the, of the purpose of this world is to create a dear betachtanim, a dwelling place for God down in the finite world. So an infinite into the finite. To, to accomplish that, it has to be a finite world. So a finite world has its challenges. There's a, my youngest son is in uh, at basic training for the Air Force right now. I sent him a note. He's seen the note before, but uh, I thought he'd appreciate it at this time. And when I got a my five minute once a week phone call from him, I heard that uh, he did appreciate it. But the quote is, <clears throat> all of the games in the histories of mankind come down to get from point A to point B and how difficult can we make this? <laughs> and if we look at the, you know, uh, we've talked about the, Joseph Campbell's work on the hero's journey, right? 
So the hero's journey, everybody relates to that, the concept of this epic journey. What is the epic journey? The epic journey is overcoming pain and challenges, overcoming the physicalities and the challenges of this world. That's this world. This world is overcoming those things. And so if we're, if we're looking at the, the bigger purpose, the bigger purpose is you have a finite world, how to reveal the infinite in it, there's going to be challenges in the finite world. And so what we're talking about as pain and suffering in the physical world is part of the challenge of getting through. And, and different, different people's challenges are for different things. So for example, Eov, his 70 years of suffering. So um, in the book, Chovais Lovovais, uh, uh, Duties of the Heart, he talks about the life of Job. Sometimes there are people who go through a, a lifetime of challenges, not for their own purification, not for their uh, own suffering or, or um, um, cleansing purposes, but rather so that others can learn from their example. And we see that Job, Eo, throughout his life of challenge, he maintained a positive attitude. He maintained a positive attitude in the, in the, in the toughest of challenges. And that's what we want to see. That's what's inspiring to us. When we see people go through challenges and they, and they, they overcome them, that's inspirational to us. So in the bigger picture, there's more to all the things that are going on. You know, is it that God enjoys to watch people suffering? No. But seeing people overcome the challenges placed in front of them, and they do so with, a, with that divine spirit that's within them that overcomes all of these things, that, that's the success. The, the real success, the real game is having something to overcome and getting through it and getting over it. I, on a personal note, my father suffered for, with Alzheimer's for a number of years. And I asked these questions during this time period. I, I, I couldn't see any good. Um, but I also came to understand that maybe it's not about dad. Maybe dad is, is, uh, is the, it, maybe it's about how we manage dad in a day-to-day -day basis, how we approach the situation. How do we bring out acts of goodness and kindness in, in his suffering? You know, so I don't know if that's the answer. Is it further? Go ahead, I'm sorry. Isn't there a further uh, explanation? Uh, goes back to uh, readings that says that from your father and your grandfather and your great grandfather that uh, punishment should be passed down if, if not, you know, uh, probably uh, dealt with by them. It will pass to the next generation and the next generation. And then on top of that, that punishment here is maybe 10 to 40 times less than it would have been if it would have been at the higher level. Yeah, no, that's absolutely true. Whatever the suffering he goes through here goes through a, a cleansing in this world rather than the next world. Um, but of course, you know, being a son, I don't think he had anything he had to atone for. <laughs> no, no, he, he might not have. But I, I agree with you is about uh, what you said goes back to when you're looking about giving Sadaka and that you should not see it as a, uh, an imposition on yourself. But as a blessing, so an opportunity. It, as I'm sorry, you know, you have to pay. To me, I never say no, no. It's I want to thank you because you're providing me with the opportunity to right. do what it wants us to do. So it's a blessing. Yeah, so there's absolutely. a blessing for me to do the right thing. Absolutely, absolutely. Good opportunities for us, right, Ron? Uh, you're talking about it. Alzheimer brought up another difficult question for me to answer. About two weeks ago, uh, a friend of mine 
asked me a, a question because I'm a physician and, and you know Jewish. He he has a mother-in-law who's in a uh, chronic care facility mm-hmm. who has very severe Alzheimer's disease to the point where she can't communicate. She doesn't recognize anybody. And his question was, should I say that she cannot have the COVID-19 vaccine so that it can be given to someone else who would benefit more from it? My immediate uh, high and mighty answer was, no, you shouldn't say that because it's not for us to determine who should live and who should die. But after that, I blurted that out. Then I started thinking about it. And in a sense, by doing that, we are doing the same thing because we're saying somebody else is going to die because this woman got the vaccine. And I just, I can't come to a conclusion uh, to, to, how to how to answer that other than I just don't know. Yeah. <laughs> so the, the Talmud gives us the guidelines of um, if we have an opportunity in the hand to help protect someone and save someone, then we take it. The, 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 there's no guarantee that the person that she, you know, that she, that, that she forgoes the shot and someone else then gets the shot. You know, there's no guarantee what, that they'll be protected at that time um, or that would be effective for them either. So, you know, it's, it, it's no guarantee. If there was a clear cut situation and either or, then that's a different story. But, you know, in this circumstance, you know, it, it's incumbent upon, you know, when an opportunity comes for us to take care of our health or take care of our loved one's health, we want to take that responsibility. We want to take that opportunity and do what we can. And the rest we leave in God's hands. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So <clears throat> there's a discussion here about Gehenna. Gehenna is the uh, Hebrew term for what colloquially is called hell. And the, there are different religious philosophies in the world about you know concept of hell and what that is. The Jewish concept of Gehenna is a purification process. It is nothing more than a purification process. And it's not, uh, d- um, what's the word I want to say? It's not punishment. It's not a punishment. And it's, yeah, it's not um, punitive in any way, right? It's the same concept of a koshering a pot. If I have a cast iron skillet and it's generally used for meat purposes, and somehow mistakenly it was used for dairy purposes. It's now not kosher. How do I kosher this? I put it in flames the way it was, you know, it's typically used. You put it in flames until it's, until it's so hot that it can ignite a piece of paper touched to it. And that has burned out any of the pure impurifications within the pores of the, the metal itself. And now it's kosher again. So you don't have to bury it. I thought no. you had to bury it to make it kosher. No. So, so the koshering laws are dependent on how the thing is typically used. If I use a, a kitchen, I'm a, a table knife and it gets used inappropriately, I get to stab it in the ground a couple of times and that's it. Mm. Right. But something that's, that's usually used like a pot that's usually used with boiling. So it needs to be boiled to, to be, make it koshered. If it's used directly on a flame, then it needs to be flamed to be able to be koshered. Um, but it's directly related to how it becomes impure. And so the whole purpose of Gehenna is the same purpose. The whole purpose of Gehenna is to purify the process. The neshama came down into the physical world and it was tainted by some of the actions of our life down in the physical world. And this opportunity then to become purified is the time in Gehenna. And you know, if you notice that when someone passes away, we say Kaddish for 11 months. We don't say past 11 months. And the purpose is that we say that, that the whole process of Gehenna, the worst of the worst doesn't even take a year to completely kosher, to completely t- to, to purify. So certainly, you know, our loved ones, we don't have to say Kaddish for more than 11 months. They, they certainly don't need that one. So <clears throat> the idea then is that it's, it's a blessing. It's, it's a, 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 that the suffering of Gehenna is a purification process. It's a serious one. It's not a small deal. 
but it, it's a purification process. It's for our own good. And by the way, a lot of that can be taken care of by suffering in this world. That the pain and the suffering that we go through in this world clears that out, and it clears it disproportionately. The Gemara even talks about that if you, you know, what does it mean that pain that takes away from the suffering of Gehenna? What does that mean? If you reach into your pocket for a quarter and you pull out a dime, that also counts. Even to that small degree, how much more so physical suffering, mental suffering, anguish, these kind of things, they certainly all have very powerful, profound purification process for us. So therefore, we would, you know, if we think about it, um, someone asked me the other day, you know, shortly after the tooth extraction and everything else was going on, how are you feeling? And I said, lousy, thank God. Because <laughs> I'm really feeling lousy. But at the same time, if we keep this in mind, then, then this too, there's an old Yiddish saying, Zalzayna Kapara, this, this will be a sacrifice. This, you know, whatever the, the, you know, whatever went wrong, this too should be a, a Kapara, a sacrifice on our, for our benefit, right? So when we look at those type of things as really for our benefit, that these are good things that help us, whatever small things. I, I, I had a conversation with someone just yesterday. He said he doesn't relate to the Yom Kippur prayer where we talk about all the sins that we've committed. Because there are sins in there that, you know, murder and adultery and, and all these things that, that, thank God, most of us don't relate to. And he was saying, I, I don't relate to that stuff. So I explained to him, I said, one of the, one of the challenges is that uh, if you start to know some more, you, you, know, you know, like what is that saying about getting, you know, you know too much? If you learn too much, you're for sure damned because every one of those has a refined example as well. Embarrassing someone publicly is considered like murder. If you say something against someone, contradicted to someone, even if it's something that's true, that also was part of it. So when you start looking at at, at the refined level of all of those sins. Yeah, yeah, we're, we're guilty. We're all guilty at some point. Jealousy, uh, jealousy of good things, but still there's this, they're on a refined level, you know, and then uh, who's free of the, of, of Bittel Torah? Bittel Torah is not spending all of our, our, our possible hours sitting and learning Torah, you know? How many hours do we waste on, on frivolities and, and nonsense? You know, um, so all of the suffering that we have in this world pays off a lot of those things as well. So in that sense, it's, it's really all, all for our benefit, all for our good. And so we thank God, you know, we thank God for the good as well as the bad. We thank God for the, that the, the suffering that we go through is to atone and appease for other things as well. Um, now, having said that, Having said that, there are some things that you can't, can't even begin to fathom. We talked about this before, but the Holocaust, for example, there's, there's no possible way for the human mind to come up with any excuse for that type. And you can't, I, you just, there's no way you can tell me that's good. We have to accept on faith that we only have a couple of pu puzzle pieces that we don't see the big picture and that God does. Somehow in the infinite level, in God's perspective, there, there must be good to that because God is good. But it's beyond our capacity to fathom that. There's just no possible human way. And, and the, the Lubavitch that Ebbe said, we mustn't fathom something like that because if we could fathom if we could understand that type of suffering as good then we could come to accept it and we must never accept human suffering we have to accept it's beyond our capacity to understand 
but we must do everything in our power. As a physician, doc, you know that. <laughs> we do everything we can within our power. Sometimes we don't win, but ours, we are not free to desist from the task. We have to continue and strive at all times to, to bring an end to human suffering and pain. We must realize that our inability to understand and provide reasons does not alter the fact that the Holocaust and other bitter events that have taken place in our world history, indeed, everything that takes place in the world at all, even the fluttering of a leaf in the wind is controlled by divine providence. The difference between God and human being is the difference between finite and infinite, and there is no way to expect to understand or comprehend events that reflect God's infinity. I want to stop here for the conversation today, but I'd love to hear your feedback on insights from today. I, I, the main point is that uh, for at least everything we can we can deal with, that there's ultimately uh, a a good behind it, even though we can't we can't know what it is and we have to accept the fact that everything has some good aspect it's, it's hard to do <laughs> <laughs> in That's a sense thing. it's a leap of faith yes it definitely is having that leap of faith what does that do for you It makes it easier to live uh, and, and and cope with the suffering of others. So, you know, you talk about a physician. Physicians, I think, can almost always relieve suffering. But I mean, we lo always lose the battle in the end because everybody ultimately dies. So, I think one of the one of the main things we can do is, is try hard to relieve suffering. I have some physicians in the family and we've talked about when you're in a position to help and, and you do the best you can, but you don't succeed. Sometimes that's really hard to swallow. Yes. And I've seen in the, with, with others in the military also sometimes in, in, in the situations of battle where, where you can't do anything. And it hurts. It hurts awful. But knowing that there's a bigger picture and that this is not the end, this is just part of the story, gives us comfort that you know, there's always a tomorrow, not necessarily in this world, but there is always another part to the story, another part to the journey. And that uh, those who've gone before us, they're not totally gone, and we will be with them again, in different form. But uh, eventually. We'll recognize them? Is that yes. the concept? Yeah. Yeah. A a and, and, even those family members or others that we've had conflicts with. <laughs> They'll be waiting for us too. Huh? <laughs> but the conflicts will be gone mm -hmm. because we'll all have a bigger perspective. Most conflicts are, can be resolved if people would see a bigger picture. And if people could buy into the bigger picture, conflicts disintegrate. So again, the same thing here is that, that you know, all those, time, those challenges we've had before, when the time comes, those will all dissipate and we'll be able to be totally unified in, in, in a joyous uh, fashion that uh, we haven't had enjoyed in this world. So you're saying that in the future, there's going to be a cure for terminal stupidity? <laughs> Yes, yes. <laughs> a godly perspective. <laughs> how, how does this fit in with the concept that when the Messiah comes, 
so there'll be a resurrection. Yep. Is that, I always assume that meant a physical resurrection. Is Absolutely. That? Absolutely. So <clears throat> there's different stages. Um, Olam Haba talks about a holding place for neshamas, for souls, as they get reincarnated back and forth. Every neshama has to fulfill all the mitzvahs. So it's got to come back again and again and again until it's completed everything. So we have to come as a Kohen. We have to come as a lady. We have to come as male. We have to come as female. We have to come back a number of times to be able to accomplish all of the different mitzvahs. Um, and, and then the neshamas are on holding until the time when Mashiach comes. Mashiach comes, there's stages. There's the stages where it's still the physical world, where peace comes to the world, where the nations no longer fight, where like someone switched the light on and people start bump, stop bumping into each other. <laughs> and when, when godliness is revealed, people start stop arguing, right? And then peace comes to the world. The temple is built, the base of English is built. Jews come home to the land of Israel. And, and then there's another stage which includes the the resurrection of the dead. Okay. And one of the things that's fascinating, I have a, a buddy of mine who's a professor of theoretical quantum physics, and we get that talk about time and space. And yeah, it's a construct. <laughs> and so when we, when we talk about things like, you know, the world to come, Mashiach and things like that, um, I guess in the bigger picture, it's not so hard to, to imagine. You know, the more we know, it's just our limited knowledge that creates the challenges. Anyway, have a fantastic week. Stay healthy and look Come forward to soon. seeing you again next week. All right. Thanks very much. God bless. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye, David.